please join me in standing for today's scripture reading. Today's scripture reading comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verses 9 through 17. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks. You may be seated. Would you join me in prayer? Gracious Lord, we give you thanks and praise for your word at work already in the service. We ask that you'd continue to, to speak, that you would continue to give us ears to hear and hearts that would be courageous to follow you wherever it is you're calling us to stay, for it is in your name we pray. Amen and amen. What would you call someone who is, is both at one part loyal and another part tender? One part uh, committed and compassionate. What, what would you call that person? What, what would you call someone who, um, who is willing to, uh, to be with you in the joys of life? And, and when you share something with them, it just gets better. Your joy just gets doubled. And what would you call someone who, when you share a burden, you feel relieved and they carry it with you? What would you call someone who who helps you be your best self. You would call that person friend. Amen? <laughs> friend. One of the most remarkable verses in scripture, John 15, 14 and 15, Jesus says, I have called you friends. Now we know Jesus is the Lord of Lord and the King of Kings, he's our redeemer, he's our creator, all those things. But he takes on this title at the end of his ministry of John. He says, I have called you friends. You are my friends. I, that is just, doesn't that just blow your mind? Because <laughs> Jesus is loyal and tender and compassionate and committed. He helps us be our best self. Jesus is all those things to us. Uh, it, could I be given permission to, to speak just bluntly and directly just for a second? We in the church, meaning me, have not done a good job of helping us see the importance of friendship. Typically, the, the focus is on relationships that, that, that end in some sort of romantic part, right? Marriage or something like that. But we've, we've sort of have pushed these others aside in terms of friendship, and yet it is vital friendship. Jesus says, I am your friend. I've called you friends. I've shared with you as friends. And how important it is that we not only understand friendship, but that we embrace it. If we don't, we are not embracing the full gospel. Let me say that again. If we're not embracing friendship as a key component in our lives, we are absolutely discounting portion of the gospel. And we are discounting a portion of God's children. Raina Cohen said this about the relationship we have. When we weaken, we weaken friendships by expecting too little of them. We weakened friendships by expecting too little of them. We undermine romantic relationships by expecting too much of them. It's powerful. Somehow we've got to get back to this idea of this gift of friendship that Jesus has given to us, is modeled for us, and is allowing us. And including all of the church. All the church. You see, somehow we've, we've lost 
the ability to speak into friendships in a way that are, that are powerful and purposeful. We figured that out with romantic relationships that end in marriage. But what happens if you're not married? <laughs> what happens to the single person? Where is the, the purpose and, and the hope? We've got to rediscover that because it is definitely there. And if we lose a theology of friendship, we cut off a portion of the church that is single, either because they've chosen to be that way, praise God, or perhaps they've gone through a divorce and find themselves in that, or they are widowed. And many of us in this room fit that description. And I would hate for us to say, that there is no purpose, there is no hope. For there surely is. We've got to rediscover friendship in its rightful place that Jesus gave it to us for all persons, regardless of marital status. You know who's figured out how to talk about friendships really well? Thanks for asking. The poets and philosophers, they are all over it. They understand the importance of friendship. For instance, Khalil Gibran, who wrote a book, The Prophet, says this about friendship. And every time I read friend, you just put Jesus' name here. Your friend is your needs answered. He is your field, which you sow with love and reap with thanksgiving. For you come to him with your hunger and you seek him for peace. When your friend speaks his mind, you fear not the no in your own mind, nor do you withhold the yes. And when he is silent, your heart ceases not to listen to their heart. For without words and friendship, all thoughts, all desires, all expectations are born and shared, and joy is unacclaimed. Isn't that powerful? About what relationships, of friendships do for our lives? The poet David White cautions us about a shrinking number of friendships in our lives when he says this, the dynamic of friendship is almost always underestimated as a constant force in human life. A diminishing circle of friends is the first terrible diagnostic of a life in deep trouble. For it shows us perhaps that we are overworking, that we are emphasizing our professional identity too much, that we are forgetting who will be there when our armored personalities run into natural disasters and vulnerabilities found in even the most average existence. The poet Adrian Rich, one last one, says this, an honorable human relationship that is one in which two people have the right to use the word love is important because we can count on so few people to go the hard way with us. Which is powerful about the impact of relationships, of friendship, and how it undergirds our very lives and helps us through every season. May we be reminded of how dependent Jesus was on friendships. He lived his life on this earth as a single man he understood the need to have people around you that were your kin but weren't related by blood that could be that committed to you. And those groups of people, he needed to go the difficult way with him for his suffering and for his mission. He counted on his friends. We here are a direct impact. We are the consequence of what friendship looked like for Jesus as they continued his mission. And may it be the same for us. Aristotle noted three types of friendships, relationships in our lives. This hit me this week as I was studying. The first is transactional. We all have relationships or friendships in our lives. It's because they can do something for us. We don't like to admit it, but the reality is true that we sometimes are around people because it just benefits us. The second kind of relationship is for pleasure. Someone that we just enjoy being around, our countenance brightens when we are around them. You have someone like that in your life or someone's in your life like that, you just enjoy being around them. 
Jesus is talking about that third kind, a true friendship, a friendship that is, that is based on a commitment, that is based on deep, deep love, not fleeting when the transaction is over, doesn't leave you when it's no longer enjoyable, but someone to walk all the days of your life that truly reflect your best self and help you attain it. It is those kind of relationships in our life that we desperately need in order to fulfill the discipleship that God has called us to. Matter of fact, Thomas Aquinas said, our goal in life is to be a friend of God, like Moses and Abraham and Peter and John. So how can we be a friend of Jesus? It's a place to start. And it must be where we start. And first it starts because we realize that Jesus actually chose us. I love this passage that Will wrote, read for us. He didn't write it. He just read it. So he could have written it, but he, he read it. Jesus says, I chose you. You don't have to worry about your value and your self-worth. Because I chose you. I want to be in a relationship with you. That's the place where our friendship with Christ starts. That he, realizing he chose us and then we choose him back. And it's through our faith, our commitment to him. No relationship grows without spending time with one another. Amen? You have to spend time. You have to share that relationship. Share your joys, share your trials, your troubles. And the more we share with him and spend with him, the deeper our relationship grows, our friendship grows. And the final piece is the transparency. Jesus said, you're my friends because everything the father told me, I shared with you. We cannot be friends with Jesus unless we're willing to open our entire lives to him. Hook, line, sinker, good, bad, and different. Often we are friends with Jesus when it's convenient. And the minute he starts meddling, when we sort of go in other directions. Beginning with a friendship in Christ is the way that we are friends with one another as well. Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his book, Life Together, said we as Christians never relate directly to one to another. We always relate to Christ and then that person. We always put Christ in the middle of every one of our relationships and it helps it grow and be deeper and more meaningful. Let me ask you, is Christ in the middle of every friendship that you have? Or do you have a group of people that Christ really never comes up? Let me just gently encourage you to put Christ in the middle of all of them. You'll be a better friend. And they will in turn be a better friend back. How do we be friends? It starts with being friends with Jesus. And it's following his example. Following the way that he has taught us. We put him in the middle of everything and then it is our choice, our time, and our transparency. That's how we develop these deep, abiding, transformative friendships. We learn from Jesus what loyalty looks like. It's commitment even when it's not convenient. It's commitment when it's not comfortable or easy. We learn from him what tenderness looks like. It's a healthy mix of forgiveness and compassion upon which every relationship is built. It is an other focus. Let me just invite you this morning to consider the friendships in your life. Who is it that you are cultivating these deep, deep sense of relationship with? Who helps you be a better follower of Christ? In just a moment, we're gonna to come to the table where our friend Jesus has absolutely prepared a Thanksgiving meal for all of his friends. And I'm gonna invite us to come this morning with our hearts wide open to commune with him. And I'm gonna invite us to also to ask him to fill us with the grace that we might recommit to those around us and develop those friendships within these walls 
and within every other place that you go. I'm convinced that if we want to see the fullness of Christ in our lives, we must rekindle this gift of friendship and reestablish it if we have let it drop by. Gracious Lord, thank you that you constantly are calling us to you and you're calling us friends. Thank you for the example, the model, and the power. Lord, help grow our conviction and grow our compassion, grow our commitment to those people that you placed in our lives that we call friends. And it's in your name we pray, amen.